Dilem. Thank you. Uh, we are going to welcome Leah Lem to the stage to introduce Katie Boom. Services Institute at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota, and much more in that bio there. So please check that out. And what I know from getting to know Katie over the last day is that Katie Boone is cool. <clears throat> Yesterday, during our community development workshop, she transformed our introductions into poetry, showing how deep of a listener and thinker she is, uh, acknowledging the complexity and diversity of our voices and bringing them together like instruments in a band making music. So that said, I'd recommend another delicious sip of coffee for Katie's keynote, Transformative Innovation, Shifting from Problem to Potential, where Katie will be bringing poetry to the complex practice of community and economic development, which. All right. You all hear me okay? I do have some sheets. Okay. Oh, when 
I get into some time? <laughs> All right, does anybody know what this is a picture of? Shout it out. Okay. How about clicking, clicking, clicking? <laughs> How about now? You notice anything different about this one? Yeah. See anything in the middle? You know that? That's not. You know that. Keep going. We can click one more time. How about this? Anybody seen this map before? So this this is a map of eight hundred and forty-four industrial eco regions. Also, it can be referred to as bio How about this? Anybody know what this is a map of? Migration of birds. Say that again. Migration of birds. Not quite. So this is a map uh, of First Nations peoples in the territory and land that they've been stewarding. It's also hard to do this because it's like a Polaroid snapshot in time. There's a lot of movements, like migration of birds. How about now? A little bit closer to understanding what kind of bioregion we're in here. Now you see what I see. How about now? How about now? How about now? There's a lot here, isn't there? I'm wanting to get us grounded in a good way of understanding the history of place, land, and people. How about that? So this is actually where we really truly are at. <laughs> I just want to give you all a fair warning. This is a presentation that I've been told is kind of a full body experience. Um, so make sure you have coffee <laughs> and make sure to pay attention to what shows up for you as we go through this today. There's a lot that I'm about to share with you. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm also aware of like, I'm a white woman who comes from a place of privilege from Southern Minnesota. It has connection to four generations of story. In that land and place. And this is who I am, right? Like, this is like, I am, <laughs> I can share with you, like, yeah, I've been doing this for like 22 years, figuring out how to navigate, transform, build, design, redesign, rework multiple systems, multiple different spaces of community. I'm one of two boys, and the son who's going to be graduating is a police officer this spring. I have another son who has a future in welding and uh, physical training. I'm also a musician and composer. I've been writing music since I was old enough to sit at a piano. Um, my job title is innovation manager, which I think is kind of an oxymoron. You can't really manage innovation. Um, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's what we got. And then this new thing that showed up this fall is I'm also a PhD student. As my professors are trying to get into my head and more of a scholar in training. Um, and so I'm studying organizational leadership, policy development, and evaluation studies as focus. So what I find is when they do this work, it's complex, it's complicated, it's hard to understand what causes what effects, and who gets to determine what that meaning is. And how do you do that in a good way? So how did I get here? I want to share with you a little bit about my past. So this might be going way back, but I think that's okay. 
I think it's important for you to know who I am. This is a photo of Thomas Ireland. He's uh, I come from the settler colonizer lineage. Uh, him and his family settled from Pennsylvania on Lake Chipak in the summer of 1862, at a time when food was being withheld from tribal peoples. Promises were being broken. Land was being taken. And tensions were pretty high. I've been told that when Thomas was on Lake Chetek, he served as this community building bridge maker between the tribe that had settled on the island on the lake. He created trades and goods and medicines and foods and furs and all of that. And I'm also told that this is only half the story. That's the only part I can hold, what I've been told, what I can read in my papers. On this side of uh, the screen, you can see a photo of the Lake Chetek Passage. The two girls that have the circles around their head are Roseanne and Ellen. Those are Thomas's daughters. And when the tensions were high, and it was a matter of life or death for the Dakota people, there's things that happened. Thomas was shot six or seven times and left for dead in what today is known as Slaughter State. He's also known as being somebody who potentially killed one of the chiefs from the Apache Reservation, Chief Lindbeck. And he was found a few days later by a mail carrier. And the mail carrier brought him to an army reserve camp to try and nurse his wounds and bring him back to health. And that time he was saying, you know, let's have my daughters. We need to find my daughters. So the Army Reserve camp changed course in the middle of the Civil War, in the middle of this uprising, I don't know what you want to call it, in the history of our land, power from it here. And the only reason that I'm here today is because of these folks. So this is four of the 11 tool soldiers. How many of you are familiar with the story of the tool soldiers? Good, and I'm here to tell you that. So the tool soldiers were a group of teenage boys over 300 miles away who had a commitment to peace and nonviolence. And because of that, they were referred to as fools. <laughs> so they were called tool soldiers. One day in the middle of November, a 14 year old boy had a dream where an elk approached him and the elk turned into a man's face. And the elk said, you need to pack up all of your belongings, gather your friends, load up the horses, and find these white people who are being held captive along this river and do whatever it takes to trade and get them back to safety. So this 14 year old boy followed that dream. If he would not have done that, I would not be here. So I live in this really complex space. How do I reconcile this? within myself as a white woman who's benefited from power and privilege with my white skin, understanding the history of who I am and where I come from, and recognizing that my existence is a coexistence in the space of reconciliation. For 20 years, I've been exploring what this collective healing and reconciliation really look like in practice. And I found some friends along the way of that journey. So this is a photo of Reconciliation Park how many of you have been to Mankato? You know Riverfront Drive and Main Street Hill? Those are the intersections of where Reconciliation Park is located, close to the site of the largest mass execution on US soil. December 26th of 1862, 38 warriors were hung in our downtown. And I know in my bones, in my DNA, my great 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 grandfather stood there that day. Not with good things in his heart. So we do a lot of things with white people to try and reconcile this without getting real about the conversations we need to have. So we here to take art in monuments. So this is one of those ways of doing that. This is all 38 names of the people who are hung on that December 26th morning at 10 a.m. 
And who you see over on this side, is a dear friend of mine. Just pick me up and helps me figure this stuff out together. We're still learning. <laughs> this is Joe Whitehawk. And he's sitting on a bench at Reconciliation Park that says, forgive everyone, everything. This is complex work, y'all. So here's what I'm here to do today. Not here to teach. Definitely have some things to show you, quite a few things actually. And I really want to help foster these conditions for learning. So in that, I want you to pay attention to what's showing up for you in your body, in your thinking, in your thoughts, in your heart. And I also am somebody who has this weird uncanny ability to listen pretty deeply, as Leah said. I almost hear people like music. I can get to the essence of what I'm noticing and hearing and seeing and mirror that back to you all. I don't know why I have that gift, but it was born in me, so I bring it into the work. So my goal is to help hold space for what's wanting to emerge here, based off of a couple things that I need from you. So what you see over here, I have some friends around the world that do some pretty cool things. One of these cool things that they do is called systemic constellation. It's sensing into a social field. I know that sounds jargony, but just bear with it for a moment. On March 12th of 2020, they sensed into the social field and asked, what's the message of the coronavirus? And this is what they got. Stop. Please just stop. Come to stillness. And then meet the world anew. So this is a form of deep listening. And I want you to pay attention to what level of listening you're at. This model over here comes from Theory U. I know Sharma, it's one of the clearest models I can find that easily quickly gets us into understanding the awareness of our listening. The quality of our listening is gonna determine the quality of the conditions we create in this room, and the quality of the relationships we form and the conversation we're about to have. So you may be taking this in and comparing it and judging it based off of what you know, what I look like, how I'm saying this, I invite you to go a little deeper. You think back to what Nick said about mindset, the very beginning of this whole entire two day, I want you to open your mind and really kind of take some stuff in and compare it and contrast it and test it out. What I'm sharing with you is just one person's perspective of what I've learned along the way as a light bulb from this lineage in this place. And I invite you to go even deeper than that if you can. In the sense that if you can open up your hearts and begin to listen for more in a empathic space, we might actually get to that relational level of change that's needed. And if we get there, there's a very good possibility we might even sink in deeper into what is truly wanting to emerge here. There's some challenge for you all to think about how to do this. In addition to that, I want you to pay attention to your thinking and your being. So what you see over here is called the ladder of inference. Human beings are meaning-making machines. We are constantly processing data, external and internal. We're constantly taking things in based off of what we see, what we hear, what we feel. We're testing it off of our assumptions. Our beliefs, we're forming conclusions, solidifying that into action, and taking steps from there. My goal today is to stretch this reflexive loop just a little bit. So I'm wearing what I would wear if I was out on the challenge course with you all right now. This whole presentation is a challenge by choice. Everything in this moment right now is a choice point for you and how you're showing up, how you're thinking how you're being. In addition to that, each of us holds a responsibility for what it is that you're bringing into this room, the potential that you hold, your aspirations, your hopes, your desires, your worldview, your perspective, your lineage. And we're also aligned with the intention of what the amazing team has been holding for this 10 months that has led us to these two days. So I'm here to challenge you in a good way, and it's all challenged by choice. 
So, question, are you ready to be in that? Yeah? Thumbs up? Maybe? I don't know. Okay. I got it. All right. Um, so this, this is the title of the presentation. This is the roadmap of what I think you can do in 90 minutes. If somebody who likes to operate in the ambitious and doable space. So what's at stake? We're going to ground into some peasant day stuff. We're going to talk about what's a system. We're going to acknowledge the complexity of the time we're in. We got to get real about that. We're also going to explore what evolutionary potential means. That's a big jargon word. You need to write it down and down again. Please do. And then also think about what kind of leadership we need now. From there, we're going to share a little bit of my own systems leadership journey. We'll share it cautiously. There's a lot of lessons learned that are not in this presentation. We're also going to explore how to leverage evolutionary potential. So when I say each of you is bringing something here, you are a missing piece of the whole picture that we're trying to create. We're also going to create the distinction between change and transformation. We're going to do a little bit of a celebration, share a prophecy, and close some gratitude and open dialogue. Sound good? All right. Thinking. <laughs> Not working. Next slide. <laughs> There we go. All right. So what's at stake? Let's ground into some present day stuff. Let me give you a few minutes to read this quote before the folks online. I'll read it out loud. The choices we make in the next six to 18 months are critical, and we have a ripple effect shaping the next decade and next century. We thought this was the decisive decade for climate change. No, forget it. This is it. Those 10 years that we thought we have had been now shrunk to basically anywhere between three to 18 months. Because the end of those 18 months, all of the decisions, and in fact, most of the allocations of the recovery packages will have been made. How's that for a truth to set that? What happens in this room today is gonna to shape and form the future of the community and the region. So take that on responsibility. And recognize that there are people missing in this room that need to be a part of us. So this quote comes from Christina Figueres. And I want to also be clear about what we're not going to do. So uh, this cartoon says, I want to find a bold and innovative way to do everything the exact same way we've been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> Let that go. That's not welcome here. And if you're here to do that, I'm going to ask that you go wait in the lobby. Okay, good. So let's ground into, we've grounded into this land, we've grounded into some history and some story of place. You know the lineage of where I come from. This is some social cultural context for the times. I was walking this summer and saw this sign. It says systems upside down and backwards next to a field of corn that's growing in a way that we grow it in Southern Minnesota. And it was reminding me of this lesson that I've been told over and over and over again, that systems are not broken. They're designed to do exactly what they're doing. We create systems. Oh, we should be raising our hand. So the way to right some wrongs is to turn the truth of light upon them. So Ida B. Wells, and I have an activity. I'm going to ask y'all to stand up. We've been talking a lot so far. All right. Kind of like a stand up, sit down game. Once you sit down, you got to stay sitting down. Okay, ready? Here we go. So, if you were raised in a single family residential home with parents and support and community around you, please sit down. Oh, a very well lot of people. That ends the game. That's good. There's a whole bunch of other questions after this, but we're going to keep going for the sake of time because there's a lot of things I want to get to today. <laughs> there are a lot of different perspectives about how our actions as players in these systems have continued to perpetuate inequality, harm, and injustice. How many of you have seen an image like this before? And you're familiar with these words on the screen. We have reality, 
equality, equity, and liberation. What do you notice about this? If you had to guess where you're at in this, how many boxes are you standing in? How many walls are in front of you? So what I'm here to do today is to remind us that life is always in motion. And we can sit on the bleachers and watch it get played. We can climb up on boxes and put walls and fences in front of people to give them access or no access to that game of life. But if we're going to talk about potential, we're eliminating all of the barriers and boundaries that restrict that from coming in. So we're ultimately working towards liberation because the potential that's here in this room has the potential to change the game of life or what this region looks like. So this whole thing around language and diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, I want to walk us in, into this a little bit. We had a person in the room named diversity. They may be asking this question about who is in the room. If we had a person named equity, they may respond, who's trying to get in the room but can't, whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure. Inclusion, they ask. Has everybody's idea been heard? Justice may respond, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't the majority. Diversity might ask, how many more of pick any minority identity group do we have here this year than last year? Equity might respond, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups? as a perpetual majority here. Inclusion may ask, is this environment safe for everyone to feel that they belong? And justice might challenge, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others the comfortable maintaining of dehumanizing views? Let's remember that community and economic development is about people and place. With human beings, not workforce. The communities that are already here, existing. So another way to look at this is Marilyn Fye's birth page analogy from 1983. This is a tattoo I have on my arm. <laughs> and one way she talks about this is if we think about systems of oppression as the bars that go up and down. How many of you can name some systems of oppression? Awkward style. I'll start us off. Sexism, racism, huh? patriarchy, classism, ableism, ageism, all these isms, right? So every kind of ism you can think of represents one of those bars. Now, when we look at the bars that go across, those are our social institutions. Let me name a few social institutions. What do I mean by that? Start us off. Education, government, social services. Yes, these are all the systems that human beings have created. <laughs> so, this is what happens when we look at it as a bird cage. We begin to understand that systems of oppression and social institutions are interlocking, interweaving, and reinforcing. And they create systematic, institutionalized systems of oppression. So what does this look like today? <laughs> We're experiencing a racial reckoning in a global pandemic. Time's up. This is Mankato on May 28, 2020. This is the largest group I've ever seen gathered in response to racial justice called the action ever. I've lived in Mankato, everything I remember. This is in front of the law enforcement center. How many of you saw stuff here? Or saw stuff on the news? Yeah. Unless you're living in a hole, you saw stuff, right? So let's get really brutally honest. 
about what this looks like. We think that COVID-19 is the thing that's changed all the things. And it's myopic. It is one factor that has had a global transformative impact. We have many more waves of change coming. I think of COVID-19 as training wheels for how we adapt. Because there's more stuff. We had a recession. We right now have allocation packages, right? We have all these resources. But there's going to be some long-term reverberative effects on this stuff. We have climate change. Wherever you're at, the field perspective on that. How many of you were hot this summer? And I know that that's like one, one day, right? One a week, one year. There are bigger systems and changes that are happening as a result of climate that are going to impact this region and everywhere else on this planet. In addition to that, every day, we're losing a thousand species. Our ecosystems are collapsing. Why is that? And who feels the biggest impacts of this first? Let's be aware of that. So here's some if statements. If we're gonna adapt and redesign what has been to what's coming next, this is a quote from Natalie Burke that I think is really important to look up. Without equity, we've made promises we can't keep, started what we can't finish, built a bridge that leaves us dangling between where we were, a place of inequality and inefficiency, and where we aspire to be. How's that feel true? If we're gonna adapt and redesign towards more equitable and just systems, here's a stake in the ground. When I say that, I mean, this is like a non-negotiable. We can no longer remain silent and complacent around the systemic racism and colonization embedded in every system. What I mean by that is it's extractive. It's transactional. We must center justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonize our systems with every plan and action we take from here. If we're gonna co-create more equitable and just systems in the future, as they come, let's make a distinction. We're not gonna be doing this for the community. We've seen what happens when we think we know best. We're gonna to need to do this with our communities. And how we do that is by centering lived experiences, voices of people from the communities who've been excluded to access to resources, power, ownership, and decision making. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right. So when I say system, you know what I mean. I'm assuming we have a lot of different perspectives on that. So Danella Meadows says a system is a set of related components that work together in a particular environment to perform whatever functions are required to achieve the system's objective. That's a lot of words. <laughs> but I want to focus on is the quality of your relationships are going to directly determine the quality of your results. A system is a set of related components. This is all about relationships. And I'm not talking about transactional relationships. So another thought from Robert Perzig, um, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> if a factory is torn down, but the rationality which produced it is left standing, then the rationality will simply produce another factory. If a revolution destroys a government, but the systematic patterns of thought that produced that government are left intact, then those patterns will repeat themselves. There is so much talk about the system and so little understanding. So we're gonna do a little exercise. I need you to like sip another cup of coffee. I need you to like get ready for this because I'm gonna go through this really fast, but we save some time. I'm gonna show you three images, all of the same model from different perspectives. And I want you to pay attention, really, really close attention to what you see and notice. What you see here is what Rakana Institute calls a two loops model. Two loops meaning this is like almost a living systems approach to how systems actually change and transform. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I'm going to be quiet and I want you to just pay attention to this. And we're going to do that for the next three slides. Ready? Any mark? Get set. Go. Uh, 
like language patterns. In all these different models, there's some words that are in all of them. Hospice, hospicing, system being referred to as dominant, emerging, and influencing, and steward and stewardship. That's in all three. Now, some other words are woven throughout at least two of these different models. And we've got emerging and emergence, illuminate, transition, being referred to as old and new, choice and support, compost and nurture, and innovation as a practice of naming, community of practice, and connecting networks. So back to this date, the speaking to this room. Yeah, this is the day that George Floyd was murdered. It was on my birthday, actually. So another way to think about this is we have to understand power. And there's another way to think about this and understanding what power does. Depending on who we are and how we approach this, it can be a good thing, right? So in old systems that are collapsing, we have a power over restraining force. In new systems that are emerging, we have a power with collective force. It's activating new ideas, new connections, new ways of trying things. And then this whole power to thing is a reconciling force. This is where we determine allocations and resources and decisions and ownership. So all of this is in play at all times, every moment of every day of your life and mine. When forms of the old culture are dying, the new culture is created by a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. So let's acknowledge the complexity of the times we're in. This is how we oftentimes think about planning. <laughs> point A to point B, it's gonna be a super linear journey. We've got our goals and objectives set. We've got our Gantt charts all mapped out project management of this whole entire process that we're going to roll out. But the truth is when we leave that room, we're actually stepping back into this game of life that we have absolutely no control or power over. Right? Complexity is all around us all the time, whether you know it or not. David Snowden is a really smart old white guy and I figured this might be helpful for y'all. <laughs> so he says that in a crisis, you should always deploy an innovation team alongside the business recovery team to capture the novel practice. Now, my friend Chris said that David said <laughs> that acting in complexity is understanding the evolutionary potential of the present moment. So how do we act in complexity? How do we explore this evolutionary potential? What I mean by evolution, we're gonna be working to kind of gradually develop something in this room from a really simple to a more complex form. That's what I mean. In addition to that, let's draw a distinction between problem and potential. If we only focus on the problems, we're missing out in a whole entire field of what else is available to us to address the problems. It's not coloring your solid rosy colored glasses, it's looking at all of it. So we need to shift how we're thinking about this stuff. How many of you have heard the caterpillar story? All right, so another distinction for y'all. We can like think about this as like a caterpillar has these things called imaginal cells. This is an actual biological term. These imaginal cells are in the caterpillar the whole entire time. Caterpillar crawls around, eats some leaves, decides to like, yeah, time's up. I'm going to go wrap up, wrap this up, see what's going to happen next. Goes into this cocoon. And completely decomposes into this goo. Literally. And the imaginal cells that are in the caterpillar the entire time now can like connect in new ways. And those imaginal cells have been holding the potential of the butterfly the whole time. And over time, within this safe space, it begins to metamorphosize and become something. That nobody would have ever thought was possible looking at capital. We're going to take about three minutes. Now, I want you to journal on this question. This is a quote from my friend Joe Whitehawk, the person sitting on the bench at Episode Eastern Park. He says that the longest road traveled is the 12 inch journey from your mind to your heart. So, Nick started to talk about mindset on that first morning. 
We have lots of forms of intelligence within us. I want you to get into your heart with mindset. And let this question sink in. What is it that we need to grieve and let go of in order to nourish and grow the fullest potential of who we can become? You've got about three minutes. Give yourself some time to journal on that. We'll cue some music. We'll be back.
probably didn't expect that we'd be doing grief work at an economic and community development summit, but I feel like if we don't get real about what it is that we've lost or what we feel like we're losing, we're not going to create space for what needs to show up. So we have to let go. Grief is a part of this work. So what I want you to do, to move to the next slide, is take a few more minutes, find somebody that you haven't had a chance to connect with yet, and share with them what it is that you're needing to grieve and let go of. And if you're the listening partner who listens first, really deeply listen to what your partner shares with you. We're not gonna be sharing this out into the room. This is an intimate space between you and your listening partner. And you're gonna be holding that for each other as we continue on in this work. So we've got about two, three, four minutes. Let's go for it and I'll hear you all back. Ready, set, go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll go for <laughs> Yeah. All right. You can hear me. It's like 
visuals too that we're like ready to transition. So if you can do that, you can put your hand up in the air. Can you hear me? I asked how you put your hand up in the air. If you can hear me, I asked how you put your hand up in the air. It's so hard to rein in really juicy conversations like this. So we're going to keep going. I invite you to take a pause. Take a deep breath. All right. So what kind of leadership do we need now? Strong. I need to think about it. Um, I would say there's a couple things I want to like premise this with. Like, I love Buckminster Fuller's quote about if you're going to kind of go into designing a system, you try to do something that makes the old system obsolete. And, and I hold the premise that this room has the potential to make old systems of harm and oppression and injustice obsolete. I also want to be clear that we don't need heroic action as child's play. What we need are more empathic and regenerative system leaders. So this is a book Regenerative leadership. Anybody working with me in the community development realm, well, I encourage you to get that book. Anybody in the economic development realm, I encourage you to get that book. Anybody in any kind of system that impacts human beings' lives on the planet right now, I encourage you to get that book. And it's also nothing new. How does that too? The other article that I encourage you to read if you're trying to understand systems leadership. It's an article that came out in 2011 in Stanford Social Innovation Review called The Dawn of Systems Leadership. It makes it super clear what capabilities are needed in systems leadership. How do we begin to do that? So if you want to Google it right now, you can find it, you know, to yourself. I don't care if you have your hands up doing that, that's good. So this whole entire title of this presentation is around transformative innovation. And I love that Nick set us up. It's a success of going right straight to the minds and hearts of what's here. When you said mindset, like that is tapping into this transformative space. So we can think like, you know, it's easy to point to policies, it's easy to point to practices, it's easy to look at budgets and spreadsheets, and it's easy to find all of those things and try to like redesign and rework that. But if you remember the quote from the art of art design and motorcycle maintenance. If we don't tap into that deeper sense of what are the thinking patterns that led to these policies? What are the thinking patterns that led to these practices? What are the thinking patterns that led to how we thought we could allocate resources? Yes. We have to go deeper. And when we talk about relationships and connections and power dynamics, we're starting to get into that space where we might feel a little uncomfortable. We may not understand exactly what that means. But if we can take that 12 inch long journey from our mind to our heart, we're beginning to go into that empathic space. We're beginning to notice our thinking, the impact of our thinking, and the implications for what happens in that. And that's all implicit stuff. I can't point to what it is you're thinking. I can't touch it. I can't. I don't know what that is. It's all implicit, right? So when I think about some of this stuff, if we go into that transformative change space and change our way of thinking around this stuff, what that means is it's going to change the quality of our relationships. Because all of a sudden relationships matter way more than we thought. And we're not talking again about transactional relationships. I'm talking about transformational relationships. Because when we transform from the inside out, everything around us transforms with that. And when we do that, and we're truly in authentic, deep, transformational, relational space with each other and the communities that maybe aren't in this room, it changes everything about the power of So this whole article is called the, uh, it's from FFG, Future Services Group, called the uh, Water of Systems Change. 
Um, they uh, they talk about in this whole thing like you know systems change comes from the social innovation group out of Canada. They say like systems change is about shifting the conditions that are holding a problem in place. So think about all the challenges and problems you've heard about so far within your region, within your community, within the economy. And let's make sure to also tap into that potential of what is here while we're thinking about shifting these conditions. So this book that I'm pointing to that I said is nothing new, this is like how they can kind of translate this stuff that's not new, it's really old, ancient knowledge and wisdom that comes from indigenous cultures and communities. This is a book written by white people, it's pretty graphics. So it's easy for white people to really translate. What these authors talk about is we need a journey of reconnection. So we've separated human from nature because now nature is seen as this thing that we can own and extract from instead of a living being thing that actually has story and life. It's also separating us from, like you said, patriarchy. We've elevated the dominant masculine and cut off the divine feminine. So there's this need to reconnect those pieces of all of who we are. I've got some pretty dominant male masculine characteristics. <laughs> I can hold presence in a room pretty well, but I'm also like designed as a, a female body, right? So like this whole fluidity thing is confusing. But when we honor all of who we are, when we show up in that way, things can happen. We're also not separate from the whole. So we might think we can take her on a part and only have the impact on that part. But the truth is like the sum is greater than the part. There's something nested here around how we're thinking about place and community and economy. Also, we also kind of like overvalued left brain thinking in a logical, rational, linear world of science. <laughs> and we've forgotten the creativity and the art of music and poetry and expression. So this is a journey of reconnection. Another way to think about it, how many of your organizations are set up this way? <laughs> is that how it really works? <laughs> no, it's really truly like that living systems logic. We're always in complexity, even if we're in a room trying to design a Gantt chart project manager way out of a problem. Right. So some key things from the book around living systems design, living systems culture, and living systems being. They have this amazing like little assessment that you can take. It's like a book and workbook all at the same time. So this is, if this is like mind blowing for you, welcome. <laughs> we encourage you to do the work. Do the work to get grounded into this and come at it in a good way. Here are seven key principles that the author talked about. So in regenerative practice, it's a word that gets used a lot. There's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of like, yeah, like we're regenerative. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> so life creates conditions conducive to life. Nature has been on this planet for 3.8 billion years. If my body was the life experience and extension of the planet, the little tip of my fingernail is how long human beings have existed. There is mega data and understanding and information that nature provides us and understanding how it actually works. And not in an extractive kind of way to replicate it and make more capitalistic models off of it. There's a real being part to this, a living being part to this that we need to connect to. So life is life affirming. So our arch decisions and choices and actions that we make life affirming. Life is ever changing and responsive. How many of you had a strategic plan before COVID? -19? Yeah, I see one hand in the room. That's honest. Two hands in the room, three hands in the room. Yeah, you can let all that stuff go. It's not to say that we can't have goals and strategies, but the one thing that we got to be aware of is that we have to adapt and respond along the way. 
to the changing conditions around us. Life is relational and collaborative. I'm drilling that in now <laughs> all morning long. <laughs> life is synergistic and diverse. There are some things that happen in life that are just pure magic. Synchronicity happens. That's when you know that something is happening that's life affirming. Life is cyclical and seasonal. How many of you have like really active high energy in the summer? And then you kind of want to like curl up on the couch with the book and some Netflix or whatever in the winter? Our lives are like that because we are a part of nature, not separate from. Life is cyclical and seasonal. Life flows with energy and matter. So I was told one time by a county administrator, if you're trying to get us to collaborate with you, follow the money. <laughs> what I've learned and evolved in my practice over the years is you actually have to follow the energy. Life is pervaded by a living systems field. And I want to remember that first slide that I had up on here, that living systems field is what was in that very first image on the slide. And you came into the room today on what this presentation is about. How many of you exist in something outside of that picture? I didn't think so. Any of you going back to the space station after this? No? All right. Okay. That's for me. <laughs> All right. So cultivating new and remembering old practices. Jennifer Campbell has this beautiful quote. When you practice the skills, attitudes, and behaviors of systemic leadership, you'll be open to what unfolds. You'll witness how the system taps into its own intelligence, resourcefulness, and potential. You will see it grow, evolve, and transform. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room with post-it notes of people where I've seen exactly this happen. It's the moment where it's like life connects back to life itself and the people and the potential that's there begins to like form into that and the energy and momentum begins to grow into that over and over and over again in multiple systems and multiple contexts. I've seen that happen in real life. So I want to share a little bit of a story with you about how I've seen that happen. <laughs> Let's round it into some tangibility. All right. So February 4th of 2013 was my very first ever community conversation that I had helped host and design with a team of people. This took place in Mankato. And this was all about like, yeah, how do we create welcoming communities? And it started off with a group of stakeholders that wanted to explore that. We had our token representatives from the immigrant and refugee communities, Somali and Sudanese, they, East African kind of groups that are coming into Mankato, they've been coming to Mankato for over 30 years. And they were grappling with it. We have this new organization coming in. We have all these demographic changes. We want to do this in a good way. We know that there's other services with providers out there. So how do we do this in a way that creates welcoming for everybody? And it was in this conversation that I learned a very important distinction. There is a difference between welcome and belonging especially here in Minnesota. In Minnesota, how many of you have heard of the Minnesota race? How many of you experienced that? <laughs> ah, yeah. So this distinction is we're not rolling out a welcome mat to kind of count the timer until you wear out and go away. We are actually creating space for more and more of anyone who shows up in this belong in this space and to bring your gifts and contributions to this space. There's a very important distinction in that. The conversation took off from Mankato and went to Fargo and there was 250 people in a room with 13 different storytellers dancing with this distinction between welcome and belong. Fargo was grappling with the same thing. Full influx, demographic changes, community, unsure of how to do this. Not always having a good time understanding how to do this in a good way. In the room that day, through the stories of lived experience, they found what it's going to take to cultivate belonging. Not perfect, 
always want to really grow and learn in this work. All of that led to me getting hair, <laughs> uh, not my idea, but just an idea <laughs> uh, around like, I don't want to be an entrepreneur working by myself. I want to create a co-working space for other entrepreneurs can do that. So I got a grant from Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation, had a business partner all lined up to work with me on this. We created a co-working space, the first one in Mankato. <laughs> And it was like, yeah, like there's other entrepreneurs here. I know the coffee shops are full. So let's create a space for this to happen. And what showed up was really surprising. This is a, an old friend of mine's, Marco Sajama. She used to have an organization called the Somali Community Baraka Organization. I found her through an invitation flyer that I got on Facebook after my previous time at United Way doing this whole needs assessment of immigrants and refugees and their experience and how they come in, what organizations and services are available. She was this outlier I'd never heard of. Didn't even know she existed. I get this invitation to go to this event. Like, I'm like, who is, what is this organization? Who is this person? I like, Find her on Facebook. I message her on Facebook. I'm like, hey, like, what? Who are you? What are you? She's like, well, just come to my office. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I grab my Dr. Pepper. I go to her office, and instantly, because I had a Dr. Pepper, I was like, oh, go to her <laughs> and spread those signs, right? So we had this whole conversation. I'm like, well, why don't you come to my office? I have a whole bunch of offices in my office. Like, it's a whole bunch of people doing what you're trying to do. But in a community, not like in a basement shoebox size office. Come with me. So she came with me, went to envision that. She walked in that day and knew instantly she belonged. There was windows, there was safety, there was community. And within the first few weeks of her joining Envision Lab, and getting a door and a key to her door and her incubator space in the office and the laboratory. She's like, we're gonna do an event. Can I use this whole space for my events? And I was like, absolutely, what do you mean? Like, as a member, you belong and you have access to all the things you need to do to do this. So she decided to put on an event called Somali Women Unite. The room and the building was full of beautiful colors, smells, sounds, music. And it was the first time that these women were able to come and breathe. We began to follow those patterns. All right, so what else is showing up here? We also started to see like, you know, there's a lot of women coming in here. There's a lot of like veterans. There's a lot of immigrants. There's a lot of refugees. There's a lot of GLBT community members. Why is it that they're coming to Envision Lab? And of the people that are coming into Envision Lab to share their dreams and ideas and to begin to dream, develop, and do, like, what is it about this community space that's actually helping foster these connections and communities? And what is it that they're bringing to us that's helping us understand this better? And we began to follow that building their leadership capacities, linking and connecting them deeper into more relationships in the community. And so we started to follow that. I asked one member, like, why, what would it take for you to actually really truly join us in this? And her response was, I need a key and a door. <laughs> That's how we opened up incubators. So this is Bardosa, this is Kate Hansen, that's Melissa Ketchum. We opened up an incubator space called the Collaboratory. It was a really ran down office suite with four tiny little offices within that office suite that had doors and keys. And now they had a space where they could throw their stuff, lock it up, and like eat it. Come back, feed it, and do it. Right? And so what you see here is a pop up retail shop that came out of the Collaboratory that is a brilliant idea from Natalie Pearson that is now a store that you can continue to go to. It's generating revenue. Called Vagabond Village. If you're into vintage, that is the only place to go. We also found healers of all kinds. We began we need a space for community healing. And so what you see here is the waiting area in 
and the Healing Arts Collective. Or if you're going to go in and get some community acupuncture, because self care is important. They begin to lift up their stories. They begin to link up and connect. This is an image of Fordosa before she testified at a committee hearing around what is needed in economic development within minority communities in greater Minnesota. 85% of the people coming through our door were women. And so we began to follow that. We asked them on social media, we said, okay, men, Cato, like how many women owned businesses are in our area? Ready, set, go. Within three hours, we had like 67 responses, 85 shares. And within three days, we developed a whole entire database. It was all through taking and linking and taking and linking and sharing and taking and linking. It was things that off. It was the first time, to my knowledge, that our region actually began to identify women-owned businesses as a strength. So we started to leverage that. And what we found was they needed to hear each other's stories. So this is our first permanent event. We found women who had been in business successfully for five years and said, tell us your story and give us a peek behind the curtain and the reality of what it takes. And in that space of hearing each other's stories, we inspired more and more women to start businesses. In addition to that, we also tapped into some creative economy folks. So this is a graffiti artist, a woodworker, a welder, a painter, a potter, and a musician. Each of them at one point in time came into a vision lab, like, I got this idea, I want to start a pottery studio. I got this idea, I want to start a wood shop. I got this idea, I want to start like a space where I can just like keep my paints in the winter so they don't freeze. And I was like, why don't we do something with that? So we loaded them up. This is the day that we went and visited the Twin Cities Makers, the Chicago Fire Art School, and the garage in Bloomington. The garage is a shared musician space. And then this is them going to city council to say, this is what we need in our community. This is what we're going to do. And now we have a maker space where you can do all of those things. Community led, community driven, community supported. And that little guy is my son, Betsy. It's hard to see a teenager smile, but when he's covered in sweat <laughs> from welding, that's when I see it, it's, it's blow comes back. No pun intended. <laughs> so let's talk about leveraging our evolutionary potential. Where do we begin right now, here, today? Real dialogue is where two or more people become willing to suspend their certainty in each other's presence. I want you to take one minute to reflect on this question because you might be feeling it already. From your perspective, knowing what you know now, what comes up for you in your work and practice that you wanna explore in new ways, with community. You've got a minute. Ready, set, go. All right, do you have your thing? A little seed of an idea? All right. We're going to take, I lied, it's not five minutes, it's only going to be about two minutes. <laughs> so I want you to pair up with somebody or find another table and quickly do a, a swap and exchange of what's showing up and what you're wanting to do with the community. Ready, set, go. I 
of what you're finding in this moment right now. We're going to have you come up and plaster the paper <laughs> with some post-it notes. So take about a minute. If you need to like pull us in the group real quick, get down to that essence juice stuff. We'll lift this up on post-it notes. And once you have it, you can bring it up here. And we'll just start plastering it up. Yeah. Yes. So you were just in a conversation about like what it is that you're wanting to do with community. And then you just had a conversation with people about that. So what I want to know is like, what are you noticing now? What is this thing that you can actually take with you as you leave today out of this room? That's something that's like a reminder of what this moment's like right now. And what you're seeing, noticing, and feeling in the conversations that happen. Yeah. <laughs> 
Once you have a post to or two, come on up. So I'm recognizing timing. I encourage you what we'll do is we'll leave this up and maybe even transfer them over there on the wall or something. So we've got a space to come back and revisit them. So don't worry if it doesn't stick. You can just take it All right. So there's some pretty cool things that I'm seeing showing up on these post-it notes. And I encourage you before you leave today, take some time to be with, even take a picture. I was gonna take a picture to last longer. <laughs> some really powerful things you all are sharing here. And I'm not gonna go into all the reading of all the things because you're gonna have time to look at that. I wanna remind us of like one more clear distinction between change and transformation. So if you remember the thing that I said that we're not going to do, we're not going to come up with another like brilliant bold idea to do the same thing that we've been doing for 25 years. Yeah. So we can change things. We can change our hair. We can change our clothes. We can change our furniture around. We can change our shoes. We can change our job. We can change our life. We can change things, right? But if we don't like it, we can always try and change it back. Let go of that. And transformation, we have to do that kind of inner work. So, and it's not easy. How many of you have heard of Layla F. Sot in the book Me and White Supremacy? Okay. It's a really powerful book, and I will say it's written with love. This is a quote from the introduction of her book. She says, you will become overwhelmed when you begin to discover the depths of your internalized white supremacy. You'll become intimidated when you begin to realize how this work will necessitate seismic change in your life. You will feel unrewarded because there will be nobody rushing to thank you for doing the work. But if you are a person who believes in love, justice, integrity, and equity for all people, then you will know that this work is non-negotiable. If you're a person who wants to become a good ancestor, then you will know that this work is some of the most important work that you'll be called to do in your lifetime. Here's to doing what's right and not what's easy. This work takes time. It takes time. And you need to tend to your heart along the way. There's a lot of things that you're gonna fail at. There's a lot of things that you're going to learn and grow from. 
there's a lot of things that you're going to have to be cognizant of and taking care of yourself along the way. It's not going to be written into a three to five years to keep plan. <laughs> this is the long haul game. So if you get tired or the rest, don't quit. Give yourself and each other time, pause and reflect. And you can see my little dog Coda doing some self-care on the deck, stretching out, doing some yoga, whatever it takes. <laughs> This quote from Martin Luther King Jr. kind of grounds it in for me too. Let's not be foolish in how we do what comes next. We must all live, learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly, right? For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the way God's universe is made. This is the way it's structured. So quick celebration prophecy and a little bit of time for open dialogue and Q&A. Here's Coda celebrating that I'm going to be coming home later tonight <laughs> and celebrating who's here in this room. So take a peek around. Think about all of the past lineages and connections to land and pipes that are in your bones, that are in your DNA. That you're carrying with you as a promise of tomorrow, as a promise of stewarding what future generations are going to be relying on in this region for generations to come. Let's honor that and what's here presently with us together today and what we're working towards. May the next few months of your life be complete with magnificent transformations. And I want to close out with the prophecy that was given to me by the Dakota 38 riders that come through on December 26th every year in Ankito as a part of our forgiveness and reconciliation work as a community. And this prophecy is an Anishinaabe prophecy. It's a prophecy that's held within this land. The prophecy of the eighth fire. And it says they will come to a fork in the road. One road will lead to materialism and destruction for all living creatures. The other road will lead to a spiritual way upon which native people will be standing. The path will lead to the lighting of the eighth fire, a period of eternal peace harmony and a new earth where the destruction of the past will be healed. That's it. Thank you all. We have like a minute if you have any questions. <laughs> I like the minute. All right. Thanks for all for your presence today. That was a lot to take in at each other in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, next year, and um, I feel like this is a one sided. So really who I am is the whole title right? It's all for me, right? Um, and so I look at everything through the dead fish world. Uh, and so to help frame my comments, we all know that there's a whole lot of denominations out there for, for the Dead Christian Church. You've got Metalist Assembly, you've got Pastor, you've got Lutheran, you've got Catholic and those folks. Uh, and we all say we hold to the determine whether we're right. Why is the assembly got that to determine whether I'm right or wrong? No, it's go back to the 
What I would like to invite is that we like eliminate a couple of words there. One is that it's one sided. How many people are in this room? Yes, I'm the one with the microphone. Yes, I'm the one that created the presentation. And I, and I hold that in honor and I hear what you're saying. So then I invite some curiosity about what's possible between now and five o'clock today. To leverage the full potential of each individual in this room, to leverage the full potential of a multiplicity of perspectives and worldviews, to honor the truth of who we are, no matter what our lineage is, right? and recognize, like I as a white woman from Southern Minnesota, who cisgender, right? There's a lot that I have to be aware of and the impact I have. So the other thing I want to invite is what are the tools and resources and knowledge that folks who haven't had a microphone for 90 minutes bring into this room? We white folks, we've got a lot of things that we could bring with, but there's so much more out there that we don't know. And so as white people, I think it's really important to get clear about what it is we don't know that we don't even know, right? And so I, I appreciate you bringing this. And I also recognize you share a same last name, but I don't think there's a relation. <laughs> um, and I, and I want to bring this back into that kind of space of potential and possibility. And eliminate the dichotomy and black and white thinking of right and wrong. Because that's pretty limited. I wonder about the power over, power with, and power to. How do we work with that in the room today between now and five o'clock? Let's bring that in. Does that work? All right. I think you got a break. So catch your breath. I'll be around if you have any more questions or want to have a conversation. Very open to that. Thank you again for listening and being a part of this. We are.